Well, good evening. Good to have you guys this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just want to uh, welcome you, those of you that are watching online as well. I believe this is being recorded, so um, for those that aren't able to make it out, um, you'll be able to get caught up. For those that want to be a part of it, it live and in person next week, it's also a good thing to watch in advance just so that you can be prepared for it. I always think it's best when we can gather together. Uh, if you can't, of course, online is, a, is an option, but I think it's always better. Um, there's more interaction when you're together. Um, not that you're going to be quizzed on anything, not that you're going to have to be an expert or whatever, but just as we look back over COVID, uh, a lot of students learned a whole lot more when they were in classrooms versus learning at home, right? So my goal is that you'll get a chance to, to learn in that way. I expect there'll be a few more coming in. We printed off 40 uh, sets of handouts. We're getting close to having handed out that many, which is wonderful. And there's a few more at the back, though, so if others do come in, just nod to them to, to pick up a handout uh, on their way in. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you, if this is your first time to our church, uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, we are engaging on this Revelation study. I won't say against my will, <laughs> but, but, but I, I will say that uh, um, we, we treat it with seriousness and uh, recognizing that it's not just uh, it's not a, a typical study because we're going to look in just a moment and realize Revelation isn't just a typical book. So uh, the goal as we go through this will be um, to learn. That's primarily the purpose through this, is, is to learn, to learn together. Um, I often would say whenever there's a study on Revelation that um, unfortunately you may have expectations of a study that won't be met, but hopefully there'll be other expectations that you didn't think you had that you will meet. How's that? So um, I know there's folks that, are, uh, that will be coming and they have a burning issue in their mind, like, I hope he addresses this issue. And hopefully, over the course of the next uh, 12, 13 weeks, we'll cover the majority of them. But it's, it's a good chance we won't cover exactly what you're looking for in the exact detail that you may be looking for, okay? Uh, this is also a primer study. So uh, you cannot cover everything in 12 weeks, especially in a one-hour time session that we have. So uh, the good news about this is you get to continue to study and grow in it on your own. Um, I'm hopefully teaching you how to fish, so you'll be able to go and fish for yourselves as opposed to being dependent on me uh, to, to just feed you with the fish each week. So, but it's important to learn how to, especially in the book of, of Revelation. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, uh, start off with prayer, and then we will, we will dive right in. Let's pray. <sighs> Father God, as we begin this journey together, we ask, God, that you would reveal to us as clearly as you revealed to John uh, what you are doing in this world and what you want us to know and understand from this book written called Revelation. We ask, God, that you would be our teacher, that your Holy Spirit would be, be helping us to not just remember, but to be exposed to you. Lord, uh, it is a great uh, testament to who Jesus is. And so fill our hearts with that uh, knowledge. And we know as we are exposed to you and in your presence that also transformation comes as well. So Lord, yes, we do seek to be educated, but we mostly uh, desire to be transformed and uh, encouraged by your book. Help us, Lord, to, to keep the focus on you. Uh, push away the distractions of the week. Help us to uh, use this as a, as a gateway uh, in our prayer lives and in our desire to uh, know you and see you in our lives and in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Wonderful. Ready? Here we go. So, um, buckle up. <laughs> Revelation is a different kind of a study. 
It's for, because it's for a different kind of a book. Now you have your printouts there uh, with you of these slides, so the purpose is you don't necessarily have to write what I'm saying down from the slides, but uh, it gives you kind of a framework so as you go later and reflect on, on what you've heard. This is a very uh, unique book. It is bewildering at times. Uh, there are very few folks, even uh, biblical scholars, that devote their lives to specifically the book of Revelation that do not come away without shaking their head going, wow, I don't fully understand aspects of it. So just to be aware of that, so as we're approaching it, never walk away from it shaking your head like, I'll never get it, because every single one of us has done that when we've come through and, and, and read, through, read through the book. But it's such a bewildering book. Think about the things that you're, we're going to encounter in it. We're going to encounter... Uh, Jesus wearing a robe and fiery eyes. We're going to be encountering a red dragon with, with ten horns and, 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 ten, and seven heads. We're going to be encountering a creature from the water that again has ten horns and seven heads. We're going to be seeing um, an animal that comes up out of the earth uh, that has uh, looks like a lamb with multiple horns in it. We're going to be learning about the four horsemen that are, are described in Revelation. And, and we're going to see earthquakes. We're going to see a sun that's turned to black and, and the moon that's turned to blood. There's going to be encounters that we're going to be reading through and you're going to see locusts that are the size of horses with uh, unique faces, almost human faces that are on them. We're going to be seeing the, the, the chief figure of, of Jesus, the lamb, which has seven horns and seven eyes, as described in Revelation. So as we begin to tell you some of the imagery that many of you have read through on your own, um, it's not your typical book of, of Scripture. So as we're going through it, we have to approach it a little bit differently. So um, there's, there's different, um, it's a different book. And therefore, we're studying it differently. But as well, let's see, you asked for it. <laughs> Why are we studying it? Well, seriously, um, you, you did ask for it. It is something that um, has uh, been raising up from within uh, the church global and the church local. And um, uh, for those of you that have come to our regular Wednesday night Bible study, it has been something that's been asked for a few times, and I've kicked it down the road long enough. By the attendance here tonight, I can see that there is an interest far beyond just our, uh, our faithful few that come out to our, our prayer meeting. Um, and it seems to be scratching an itch uh, that, that exists today. So... What I hope is, if there's things that you learn from it, uh, that you will feel free to, as long as we're able to do the live streaming and recording it, feel free to let others take a peek and see what's going on with it. The other thing that you, that you need to know is that as I have gathered information and as I'm presenting this, this is not copyrighted Perry Hanley, okay? If you hear something really great and really brilliant, Perry didn't come up with it. Perry probably gathered it from somewhere else. So feel free to share this as well. Um, and if you hear a quote or something along the way, that's great. I would just encourage you not to say, Pastor Perry said, da-da-da-da-da, because Pastor Perry probably quoted somebody else as he's saying it. And just so, I just don't want to be taking the credit for somebody else's work. That's, that's basically what I'm trying to do. But as I'm trying to consolidate and bring together all the other pieces together, if I stopped every gospel of gospels, and especially as we look to the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew was written for the purpose that if you came from a Jewish background, a Hebrew tradition, and you wanted to know what is this that they're talking about, this Jesus, the Messiah, that as you read through the book of Matthew, it is written for the distinct purpose to help people that come from that kind of a background to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament and that to lay out a whole description of who he was, what he did, that he died for us, that he rose again, uh, but specifically to an audience 
that was from a Hebrew background or a Jewish background. And the same thing can be said for a lot of the books of, of Scripture. Colossians was written to a church in Coloss, and it had specific uh, needs and specific situations, and therefore the book was written uh, specifically to them. And we glean from it, of course. In this uh, book, we see that this is not written to a specific church. It is, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ is how it's described. So it is meant to go to everyone in the church, but specifically at the time that it was written and the time that we can read it and understand it. This last book of the Bible was written uh, for those that were under pressure to compromise their allegiance to Jesus. Now, what was happening at the time, and we're going to learn about that as we, as we study, is that there were many people that were feeling the pressure to deny Jesus, to deny Christ, to go back to a different way, maybe a Jewish faith, maybe to go in allegiance to a Roman God or, or such as that, or just to be a very polytheistic um, culture, big fancy words, sorry if I throw them in, forgive me, uh, to be in a multi-God, a multicultural context where, you know, well, Jesus is okay, but so is this God, and so is that God, and so is this way of being, and just a, a coexisting kind of nature where Jesus isn't supreme. So there was, there was a pressure to do that, and the people that this letter is written to, some of them were realizing that, and they were resisting it strongly. There's others that weren't even aware that this pressure was existing, but they were just starting to fall along and fall into the crowd because what everyone else was doing, they just kind of went with the flow. And so this book is written to help uh, awaken those that are going with the flow, but also to be a reinforcement and kind of a battle cry for those that are seeking to keep Jesus primary in their lives. Okay? That's one of the reasons why it's important to study it. Also, there is no other book that explains what is going on in the world better than what this book does. Um, it explains why we're in the situation that we're at, where it's going, um, and it does uh, in a way so that we can keep our balance. Okay? It's written to describe... Uh, how the world is right now. It's, it's a good description of how the world is right now, but it's also written to give us a grounding in an uncertain world. Uh, I use this graphic here. It says, please note the post-apocalyptic fiction section has been moved to the current affairs section. Um, and we, and we, say, we see that in a world that really doesn't know much about Christianity, uh, in a world that is probably the least church that it's been in decades and decades and decades, you will hear uh, and see in our culture things like, well, I'm just going to open the door today and see what chapter of Revelation we're in today. Or, you know, I'm expecting the end of the world to happen. People that don't even know Revelation or know uh, much about Christianity are feeling that there's a sense of there's something that's happening now that um, it's just awakening them to go, well, what is that big plan? What is it out there that's happening? What has God revealed to people? And so, so there's an interest um, in, in understanding uh, what God has laid out so that we can understand. The other thing that I think we sometimes miss in the book of Revelation is that it is the most comprehensive portrait we have of Jesus Christ. When the book is read as it's intended to be read, we see Jesus as the one who overcomes our fears and ignites our passions. Uh, and I want to say that because right from the very first night, and I wanted to make sure this was very important that all here right from the very, very first night, as we're reading through the scripture and as we're reading through Revelation, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we are missing one of the key components of Revelation, the key component of Revelation. We're going to see that in just a moment. It's kind of like how we have friends that talk about heaven, but when they're talking about heaven, they're talking about where their puppies go, 
Or when they go to heaven, they're going to be talking about how they can eat all the cheesecake they want and not get fat. Or, you know, all these different concepts they have about heaven. And when you say, oh, yes, you mean the worship of Jesus on the throne. Oh, no. No, 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 not that thing about heaven. I'm just talking about heaven where, you know, there's no more pain and no more suffering. And we all get together and we'll be, you know, we'll be toasting one another with a beer. And, you know, it's, it's all going to be great. You know, when you remove the key component of heaven is about Jesus and revelation is about Jesus, when you, when you try and look at that book apart from Jesus, you're, you're, you're ripping it apart. It, you're, you're, just, you're, you're just doing a disservice to the book. As we look through it, we will see the most comprehensive portrait of Jesus ever as we look through it, even more than in the Gospels, if you can get that through your head. So, that's our, that's our start. Now, uh, as we do this study, your job at home and your job here is to bring a Bible that you can read and understand. Okay? So bring your Bible with you. I will print off notes. I will print off slides. I will not print off the scriptures for you because I want you to have your own Bible here to be reading yourself to, to be working through. Okay? So uh, we're going to start with... Uh, Revelation chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 12. So uh, if you're uh, at home, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, I'll be reading it as well. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Um, and so uh, as you may or may not know, there is another teaching I can do at some point to talk about the different types of translations and versions, etc., for this study, the most important thing is that it's one that you can understand. Okay, that's the most important thing so far, is that it's the one that you can understand. So, here's what Revelation, starting at chapter 1, verse 1. And please, everyone at home and here, follow along. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads about the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. Greetings and doxology. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you. From him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, and has been and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus, uh, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you have seen to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned I saw, period. I'm going to stop there. It went on to say what he saw, but we're just going to get to that point tonight. 
already in those 12 verses is 50 sermons. <laughs> as a pastor reads through that, he goes, my, 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 and, and you just start to drool all, as all the description of Jesus is laid out there. So uh, as, as we read through this and we understand uh, the strange and bizarre, we're going to be learning about this, um, th this, this great, great work. So um, make sure you, you keep your finger there. So the introduction. Well, the first thing to say is that this is a book of immense learning. As we're, as we're going through this book, uh, we will learn a lot. Uh, as, we go through the, as we go through the Gospels, we understand about Jesus. We can relate to Jesus. We hear stories about Jesus uh, and the disciples. We learn some that way. As we go through the letters of the New Testament, we see how uh, God's Spirit is interacting with churches and how people are responding or not responding to, to God's movement amongst them. And, and we can relate that way. But in this book, uh, this, this book, this revelation, or the, another word for it is the apocalypse, which we're going to be seeing in just a moment. The apocalypse uh, is a book of immense learning. And so where do you even start? Well, the first thing I would say is that we need to start in realizing what is the purpose of the book. How many of you have ever written a letter to someone? Okay, or an email. I know nowadays, <laughs> right? When you go and write a letter for some, to somebody, there's always a purpose behind that letter, isn't it? There's always a purpose. You're, reading, you're writing it to say, happy birthday. You're writing it to say, here's my check. I want my bill paid in full. You're writing it to say, Dear John, whatever the purpose is, you're writing a letter and there's a purpose behind it. It's so important to know what the purpose is when you pick up a piece of literature. And when we're picking up John's revelation, the apocalypse, uh, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and John is writing it, you need to know what the purpose is. So the purpose of this book is um, it, it's fivefold. So the first one is this. The purpose of this book is to uh, honor the title of the book. The book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a book about Jesus Christ. Right? The book is about Jesus. It is about a person. And as, it, as, as it's worded, it says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ it means it is of Jesus, the person of Jesus. It is by Jesus. It is about Jesus. Um, as, as we begin to understand, uh, as we read through this book, it is all coming from, through, centered in, and, and flowing from Jesus Christ. We see it from the very beginning to the very end. So it is a book about Jesus. And as we uh, look to this revelation of Jesus, we use the word revelation, but the old versions of, I believe the King James may use the word apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It is a revelation is a translation of the word apocalypse. Now, when you hear the word apocalypse, what are some synonyms? What are some other similar words you can think of to an apocalypse? What do you think of when you hear there's an apocalypse? Pardon? End of days. End of days. Yeah. And what if I said there's apocalyptic weather? Once, a, once in a lifetime, what else? Destructive, right? right. It, it, we are uh, in a world right now that as we look to Sunday, we're hoping that the hurricane is not, to use society's term, apocalyptic right, where we're going to, it's going to be tragic. Um, when, when, we, uh, when we hear that, unfortunately, uh, society is using the word actually wrong. In fact, they should be using the word uh, cataclysmic or catastrophe. I think a lot of times apocalypse is equated with the word catastrophe, and it's not true. Okay, that's not a true meaning of the word apocalypse. 
uh, apocalypse, if you talk to a first century person and they said, there's going to be an apocalypse tomorrow, they would say, oh good, wonderful. Because to them, the word apocalypse, the true meaning of the word apocalypse, means that there is going to be something that's going to be revealed. There's going to be something that's going to be opened. Somebody's going to come tomorrow and there's going to be an apocalypse. Oh, good, now I'm going to get to see the unveiling of, you know. There'll be an apocalypse of the statue. There's going to be an apocalypse of the teaching that that person has done. Oh, this is going to be a time where I'm going to come and there's something that's going to be revealed. And uh, there's going to be a box that's going to be opened. There's going to be a curtain that's going to be pulled back. An apocalypse is a revealing. That, that's, the, that's the pure meaning of it. Uh, an open door, uh, uh, an open window, a pulled back curtain. Um, so that what has always been there can now become visible. That's the purpose of it. So what, what has always been there can now become visible. Another um, uh, way of uh, describing it is, I grew up in St. George, New Brunswick. Robin, you know where I grew up. And uh, in St. George, New Brunswick, it's along the Bay of Fundy. And typically, the fog stays till 10 in the morning. And then she rolls out, and you have a nice day, and about 6 o'clock at night, the fog starts to roll in again. So an appropriate word for the word apocalypse would be at 10 o'clock, an apocalypse will begin. The fog goes back, and then we get to see what all of us see up here in Oromocto, the sun. You know, it's an amazing thing. I'd wake up in the morning here, and it's like, the sun is up. Did I oversleep? Like, <laughs> so, and it's showing what's always been there, but it's been hidden from our sight because of a barrier that was put there. The fog was a barrier, so we couldn't see. The sun was always shining. The truth is, as the hurricane comes through on, on Saturday and Sunday, the sun is still shining. We can't see it because it's been covered by the, the rain and the clouds, but the sun is still shining. And the apocalypse will be one that removes so that we can see what is already there, what already exists. The other thing, too, about the apocalypse is not, it's not starting something. It's showing what's already there. Okay? So, so it's showing what is already there but, but hidden. Um, Let's keep going with that. There, um, uh, when we're talking about the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, we're talking about a pulling back of the curtain of who Jesus is. So we actually get to see who Jesus is. Not who Jesus is going to become, but who Jesus actually is, the person uh, of who he is. When it comes to apocalyptic literature, there's two purposes of it. Uh, the first one is to set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the future. As we read through the book of Revelation, we will see in chapters 21 and 22 that Jesus is coming. And the reality and the truth of that, it's going to happen to, to know that helps us frame how we live in the present moment. There's a whole lot of people that's living as if there is no God, that there is no Jesus, that he is not returning, and so they're living a certain way because of that. But we, by having revelation, we get to see, and we don't see that in any other book of Scripture, we get to see what the end state is going to be like and by seeing that, it will hopefully shape our present and how we live in it. So, for example, to know in Revelation where Jesus comes and he wipes every tear from our eyes. That helps us today when, there's, when we have tear-filled eyes, right? When we are working through sickness and sadness and, and disintegration, and to know there's a time where it's all going to be brought back together. And there's going to be healing. And there's going to be restoration. That helps us 
get through our temporary struggles. That's what we see, we see laid out in, in the letters of the gospel, but we see uh, the letters of the New Testament, but we see it clearly shown in the book of Revelation. So it sets our present moment in the light of uh, the unseen realities of the future. And even, maybe even more importantly, it's the second purpose, is that it sets our present moment in light of the unseen realities of the present moment. All right? Not just of what will be helping us to give us hope and assurance as we move forward into the, the future that's been revealed, but also in the present moment of how we live in our present reality. Because there's more to our present to know than just what our intellect can pick up on. There's more to our present that can be known than just what scientific method can show us in the world that, 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 that we have. As we, for example, as we're to use science as an example, um, we're learning now how vast the universe is. We thought it was big before, but now as we get the most advanced uh, equipment to extend to see the most advanced extension of the universe, we're getting, wow. That didn't just appear. That's always been there. But with the apocalyptic literature, with apocalypse, then we're, we're now able to see what already exists presently. So as we're reading through Revelation, it's not just a book about hoping for the future. As we read through Revelation, we're also going to see more clearly, here's the situation we're in right now and today. And just open your eyes to seeing that that exists even now uh, in, in certain areas. Um, to know where we're actually at. Um, okay, the next. So we honor the title. Uh, the litmus test of reading this book properly. And you may have to come back to this lesson later on. The litmus test of reading this book properly is what consumes our focus. If we read this properly, we will end up at the feet of Jesus. Period. As we read through the book of Revelation properly, we will end up at the feet of Jesus. If we end up anywhere else, we've read it wrongly. We've read it for not what the purpose is. If you're writing a note to someone and you're wishing them a happy birthday, saying that your father and I would like to wish you a happy birthday, uh, here's, here's uh, $5 to go get a gift, and uh, we look forward to seeing you this summer when you come to visit. Um, the, uh, we've, we've got a birdhouse here that we've just finished up, da-da-da-da-da. If you read that letter and you come back and you go, did you hear about the birdhouse? Right? It's all about that birdhouse. That birdhouse. I can't wait to see that birdhouse. It's like, that wasn't the purpose of the letter. It was a piece of the letter, but it wasn't. The purpose of the letter was not written to say, oh, there's a birdhouse coming. The purpose of the letter was to say, we love you, happy birthday, and here's some other little things along the way. As we read through Revelation, if we become preoccupied with the 666, if we become preoccupied with the Battle of Armageddon, and if we become uh, preoccupied with uh, little small aspects of, I believe that this beast means this one thing, and we miss that it's about Jesus, we've read it wrong. Now, in saying that, we're going to explore the 666. We're going to look at the Battle of Armageddon. These are all components of it, but they're all pointing to Jesus as opposed to Jesus existing to point us to the 666 and whatever. These are, these are, are side issues. They are not the issue. Right? By the way, just to, just to wet your whistle a little bit, the Battle of Armageddon never happens. Did you know that? You'll learn it. It's ready to go, but Jesus comes, peace descends, poof. Right? How much of our lives have been worried about the Battle of Armageddon coming and how the, how the war is going to take place? And we read in Revelation, it doesn't take place. They gather, but Jesus comes, peace reigns, poof. See? 
Our presuppositions read into Revelation when we don't actually take time to see, oh, Jesus stops it. Anyway, <clears throat> I digress. We will cover it as, as we move forward. All right, second thing, the nature of the experience that John had. So, as we read through Revelation 1, and again, I always encourage you to be, to be looking at your um, Bible as we're going through this. In Revelation chapter 1, what type of experience was John having when he wrote this letter? Right? I know in my mind, I need to make sure if I'm writing a critical letter that I'm not hangry when I do it. <laughs> I need to make sure I'm in the right mood. And if I have to write something, uh, you know, that I'm in the right setting. So what was the nature of John's experience? Well, we see that John um, was uh, on the island of Patmos. That's what he tells us. We're not coming up with this on our own from, from biblical scholars. It's right there. Uh, we see it in verses 9 and 10 that John was on the prison island of, of Patmos. Uh, it, was, it was a place... Um, that had uh, sulfur mines, and uh, the nature of the sulfur was so bad that many of the prisoners on the island, John was put there for punishment. It was a, it was a punishment uh, place. And many of them had their eyes wrapped with bandages because of the uh, sulfur and how it would actually eat at um, uh, organs like, like your eyes and soft, soft tissue. Uh, but he was on the Isle of Patmos. It doesn't say he was blindfolded or anything like that. And it says also, it was the Lord's day. So what do you think that means, it was the Lord's day? Christmas or Easter? Well, not necessarily, but you're getting close. It was a Sabbath day. It was a Sunday. It was a, a day that was set aside for the Lord, worshiping. So um, this is a day where he was taking time to worship God, the Lord's day. There's a reason why he said the Lord's day. Right? So it was a day where he was worshiping. And it tells us that, uh, and I've picked out a section here from Revelation 1 and verse 12. It says this, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and after turning, I saw. Remember, I stopped there when I was reading the scriptures. It goes on to say, I saw the seven lampstands, etc. We see um, that as it's being written, there is some type of a thing that was happening with John where he physically heard and he physically turned and he saw something. So we're not talking about a mystical experience that he had in his mind. We're actually talking about something that he saw. And in fact, as we go through the book of Revelation, we're going to see 24 separate times. John says, I saw, I saw, I saw. Okay? And so as we're going through this, we need to realize that the book of Revelation and the experience that John had is that it's not a book where John is interpreting. When we read through the Gospel of John, John has seen Jesus live out his, his earthly life. He was a, an eyewitness to Jesus, his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And as John is compiling all that information under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's coming up with a pastoral type of a, a letter. And as John is being written, we have these beautiful passages in John, like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was written in a way that as John was hoping his, his readers would realize, this is the difference that Jesus makes. This is why you should put your faith into Jesus Christ. Because he does what he says, and I can testify it uh, as an eyewitness. This is what he does. When we're reading through Revelation, we're reading through, uh, instead of um, John taking what he's seen and interpreting it and, and writing it in a way so that here's so you can understand, it's just the opposite. He's writing, here's what I saw. Here's what I saw. And um, as, as we see what John sees, he sees what's often described as a living drama. So today, we would say it would be like turning and watching a movie. 
or turning and watching a television program. What he went is, this is what he saw, right? And uh, from what I've read on it, it sounds like the way it would be described is Jesus is putting on a play. And as, as this play is laid out in front of John, it's a play with different acts and different scenes, with different actors, with different sound effects, with different characters. And even with these different characters, these different characters would have costume changes, right? And we're, we're going to see uh, that John saw like this animated type film and in this, what he's seen, he sees things that's like imagery from, from the Roman politics. We're going to see imagery from the Old Testament. Uh, by the way, uh, as we look to the Revelation, it's amazing that it quotes the Old Testament uh, exactly 150 times. And about 250 times, it refers to things in the Old Testament. So uh, there's, it alludes to the Old Testament anyway about 250 times. So John is not interpreting or telling us the meaning of what he saw. He's just describing it. So, um, yeah. Okay, so um, we see that John is not interpreting or telling us the meaning. He's just describing it. I'm, I'll go on just a little bit on that. In chapter 5, uh, Jesus is the lamb that has seven horns and seven eyes. And John saw this. And this is very symbolic. We're not told exactly what the symbols mean, but it's very symbolic of what he, he has seen. And, and others um, will take what John has seen and they'll go, you know what? I think what he saw was like this. For example, if John says, I saw locusts, people today can say, well, you know what? John saw something like locusts. Maybe that's the best way he could describe it. You know what I think it is? I think it's probably helicopters that he saw. Or, you know, he saw, he saw fire from heaven. And, you know, maybe that's missiles. And maybe that's, maybe that's this and maybe that's that. From um, the best one is of John chapter, John chapter tw uh, Revelation chapter 12, where it says that, uh, that an eagle comes and rescues uh, the people. Uh, basically the people of, of Israel, the people of promise, that an eagle comes and rescues them. And uh, American, believe it or not, American theologian says, you know what, that would be a rescue flight from the U.S. taking the people of Israel away from there. You know, the big eagle on the plane, the whole bit. But the problem is, is that uh, even though that, that sounds like it could be something, well, in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, um, God says that an eagle will rescue uh, the redeemed people on eagle's wings. So there's some illustrations that are tied more to Scripture than they are to our modern interpretation of what maybe he saw. So uh, I'd say just to let go of the thoughts of, I think I know what that means. And instead, let's let the, let's let the Bible tell us what he saw, okay, rather than trying to interpret it. There's a lot of scenes, they change fast. There's a lot of characters that change. And um, Jesus changes his costume a lot. So we're going to see Jesus in Revelation, not as the same person all the way through, dressed the same way. He's going to be wearing a, uh, he's going to be like a man wearing a robe. Then he's going to be a lamb with seven heads and seven horns. Then he's going to be a shepherd, etc., etc., etc. So same character. New play, new act, new costume, new purpose, right? So as we're going through, just to, just to not lose that. Okay, next thing. Keep the large structure of the book. I, I have the breakdowns here for you. I'm not, I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. I'm already at 45 minutes. Um, however, just to know that um, the book is written in a way that there is an introduction and there is kind of a conclusion, a prologue, an epilogue, to use the fancy words. When John writes his gospel, we see that in John chapter 1, he goes through, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and gives us a little preamble of what he's going to be talking about. And at the end of John's gospel, it kind of wraps up um, uh, the, the tail end of the story. 
Well, same thing kind of happens here in Revelation. In the first eight verses, we see John uh, describing, here's what's going to be happening. Um, this is the revelation that was given to me from Jesus, and he goes on and on and on. Then we stop, and then there's the main component of the vision and the encounter that John has had. And then at the very end of it, we see in the, in the last uh, 12 verses that he is uh, wrapping up uh, the summary of, of what he has seen. So in that large section uh, of the main vision, there's um, what we would say, all, here's where we get a little complicated already. Where is the first night already complicated? Depending upon the scholars that you read, some people like to make things nice and neat, right? right? I have a buddy, Gordy Cook. Gordy Cook, good friend of mine. Every sermon he preaches, he's like, I've got four points. I need them all to start with the same letter. I'm like, Gordy, no, no, this works for me. And so he wants to make everything start with the same letter. Everything has to start with the letter G or whatever. And I think sometimes we come into Scripture and we want to make things fit really well. And we kind of, we're kind of like a Cinderella slipper. We're trying to make something fit even if it doesn't because, you know, it, it's got to fit. So some people say, oh, Revelation, there's a lot of sevens. So, you know, there's seven acts and there's seven plays, and so it's 49 different things. I, I, I think they're stretching it to do that. So what I'm going to do is, from what I've read, I'll share with you that since the title of the book is The Apocalypse or The, or the Revelation of Jesus, The Opening of Jesus, I'm, I'm going to break it down into kind of four sections um, where there is an opening. So the first section is Jesus and the seven churches. Most pastors that preach on Revelation stick to the first three chapters, and they say, well, we're done. Because, boy, those are easier to preach. <laughs> so the first section is Jesus' word to the churches, the seven churches uh, in, in, in uh, Asia Minor. Um, the next thing that we see is um, section... Um, 4, 1 through eleven eight, And how I'm dividing these is when um, John says, I saw something opened. Well, since we're using the word apocalypse, which means opened, I'm dividing it off into the four sections where things were opened. So the first thing we see is the open door in heaven. So as he looks into heaven, as that has been revealed to him, he exposes these things, and that goes from chapter 4, 1, through to chapter 11, 18. Of course, we're going into detail on these down the road, but this is the introductory lesson. The second one is, there is, a, there is John saw and opened before him was the temple of God in heaven. And we see uh, imagery and, and things unfolding in that section in 11, 9 uh, through. And, and we, we see in that section more of the throne room and the lamb, and we, we see that type of a thing. The next, we see uh, the opening of the table, ta the temple of the table of, uh, tabernacle of testimony. Do that one three times fast. The temple of the tabernacle of testimony is opened up from um, Revelation 15:5 through to 19:10. Uh, and that we see uh, cosmic signs and wonders that are happening. Uh, so that happens in that one where that's opened up. And then in the fifth one, well, I, um, I have four, but it should have been five. The fifth one there is where he saw heaven opened. And that's from verses 19, 11 through to 22, 9. So, uh, and from that, then after that, we have the, um, we have, uh, we, we go to the epilogue. And then that one, you know, when we see that opened up, when we saw heaven opened, we see Jesus on a horse and the temple and the lamp and, He's described as the morning star, etc. Okay. Um, next thing to remember as we're reading through whew, is this. This book does not proceed chronologically. Got that? This book does not proceed chronologically. I will not judge you if any of you have ever watched a soap opera in your life. Okay? I will not judge you. One of the, one of the things that happen in soap operas is that as you're going through, every once in a while, there's a flashback, right? And there's a, something that happened many years ago. Um, there's a lot of flashbacks in Revelation, okay? So the drama is not beginning to end consequential. 
if you've read it trying to think it's that way, like it's one of the books of history, like it's the judges of the Old Testament or Deuteronomy, and you're expecting it to flow right from beginning to end, that's where you're going to lose your mind, right? Because as you're reading through Revelation, you're going to be having something, and then it's going to pull back. And then you're going to see something else, and then it's going to pull back. So just to know that there's a, a bit of a wavy flow to it, as opposed to a straight line. So um, the question is not what happens next. The question is, um, what did John see next? Okay, you got that? As we're reading through Revelation, it's not what happened next, is what did he see next? Um, so, um, when we're reading through it, we, if we think about it chronologically as moving step to step to step, what can happen is we can, um, we can think, okay, the end is coming. So as we're reading through, we'll read about the seven seals that are opened. And after the seven seals are opened, okay, now he's coming. Whoa, no, he's not. And then later we go, oh, seven trumpets. Oh, he's definitely coming now. Whoa, no, he's not. And it pulls back. And it's kind of like a spiral staircase. As we're reading through, a, a really good illustration is when we get into chapter 12. We're going to see an account where there's a red dragon trying to uh, destroy a mother and a baby. And um, that is actually Christmas that's being described, where Satan was trying to take out Jesus before he was born, right? So as we're reading through, we know that this has already been written after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So we know that that account that's being written there is referring back to something. So it reminds us that as we're reading through Revelation, it's not chronological. It'll pop back and forth, things that have happened, things that will happen, things that are happening presently, just... Just, just allow it to happen. So it's not what happens next, is what do you see next. The next thing I would say is to put on your prologue glasses. So John is framing the upcoming vision with key themes. So as you read through Revelation 1, verses 1 through 8, there's a whole lot of little descriptions that are in there. And it's kind of like... Um, um, I, I know there's some of our folks, Doug, Doug McLean, you're probably watching from home. Robin, I know you're one that's been trained in the military. Joe as well. They teach you in the military, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Am I right at that? Tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and tell you what you told them. Well, this is what John's doing. In that first little prelude where you go, oh, isn't this nice? It is nice, but read it a little bit more carefully, because as we go through and as we see things that John is saying in verses 1 through 8, he's saying how Jesus is coming, the time is near, that these things must take place, that there will be uh, faithful witnesses, that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead, that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And as we realize those thoughts in the back of our minds, we're going to be seeing as we see the writing out of Revelation, Oh, that, what he talked about in verse 7, here I'm seeing it in chapter 13. Oh, what he said here in verse 3, oh, I'm seeing that in, 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 verse 11, in chapter 11, right? These are things that are going to be unfolding in the book of Revelation, that he is coming, that he is the firstborn of the dead, that he is the ruler, he is the king of, king of kings, that we are released of our sin, that we are, we are made as, um, as a kingdom people, we're installed into office, we're going to see how he is the Alpha and Omega. Uh, we're going to see that he is the source of all. And it's not just about what might be, but it's, it's an apocalypse. It's showing what is. Like, this is truth. You're getting to see the truth. This is what is. It's not like, I hope if everything works out, this is what the, the goal of the end plan is going to be. It's like, here's what's already been established. This is what you can, this is what you can count on. Right? So, the, the, remember that as you're reading through it, these things are going to be important as you're going through. Another thing, uh, and I just list them off and you have them printed for those of you that, that came out. But the other thing is the last thing here, is that you need to adopt the right posture. Because um, 
as we're reading through the scriptures, we need to remember, John saw this on the Lord's day. And John desires us to uh, come to this revelation of Jesus and come with a posture of worship, right? While worshiping, we experience. Um, I can't get through a one-hour, I can't get through a one-hour uh, lecture sermon type thing without using an illustration. So, once upon a time, there was a man that uh, was converted to Christianity from a horrible past. He was an amazing sculptor. And he took into account all of the different aspects of the very nature of Jesus. His justice, his compassion, his strength, his meekness, all of it together. And he, and he created a statue that he believed could encapsulate all of those different things. And as people came to look at that statue, they would look and, and they would look and they would go, okay, I, I'm, I'm seeing some of this, I'm seeing some of that. And they would look to the sculptor and they'd say, how, how should we view the sculpture? He said, there's only one way. He said, here, come and bow here and look up. Because that was the best vantage point of looking up and seeing what the statue was meant to be. And I believe as we look through Revelation and as we seek to understand Jesus, as we come in a spirit of worship, as we come kneeling before him and looking into him, we will begin to capture the fullness of what is trying to be revealed uh, to us. But it, it comes with a humility and it comes with a worship nature. If we come as know-it-alls to Revelation, we will leave wanting. If we come expectant, and in a worshipful heart, we will leave rejoicing in our study. Okay. That's lesson one. Okay? So you get an idea of where we're going in the future. We'll be digging in next week again. Continue reading on. And uh, thank you for watching at home. Um, I know this will trigger conversations and questions. Super. Enjoy them. <laughs> I'm not an expert on it. I'm just trying to teach us the, the, the foundations of it. Thank you. Great.